Good evening and welcome, welcome, welcome to this evening. I hope you guys have been having a great day and I wish I could be there with you, but I'm not. I'm here, so you will have to put up with me being on the screen. And uh, if I say a word that you don't understand at any time, just nudge the person next to you. Give them a pro prod and say, what does that word mean? And if there's a really uh, strange word and you're all prodding each other, Perhaps you can pause this video and make sure that we don't miss anything in translation because this evening I want to talk with you about the importance of praise and thanksgiving. It's really easy to go through life spending our time looking at the bad things that are going on around us and lots and lots of studies have now shown the importance of thankfulness. Well, we could have saved them uh, thousands of pounds spent on research to discover that people who are thankful live happier, better lives and cope with problems more simply by reading this Bible to them. This book, it says, give thanks in all circumstances. What? Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. This sounds like crazy language, doesn't it? And yet, when we learn to be thankful for the things that we have, um, and not to worry too much about the other stuff along the way. It's amazing how we find contentment in that. But this thankfulness cannot be separated from a relationship with God. And uh, there is a bit of a move around the place in secular society to talk about the importance of being thankful and being positive and being um, uh, being uh, looking for the best in each situation and being grateful for what you have and, and that's right it's a principle found in scripture but this evening I want to take it a little bit deeper than that I want us to look at uh, particularly two passages of scripture together and then in small groups we're going to have a little bit of a um, some discussion time to talk about things that we are thankful for as well as singing a song and I don't know how this is going to work um, with me speaking on the screen in this way, um, but we will find a way and I'm, I'm sure it's going to be fun. So if you are ready for some fun tonight, ready to enjoy yourself, let's start by digging into scripture for some principles and uh, then I'll explain more about the second part in a moment. Here we go. First of all, we're going to turn to the book of Second Chronicles chapter 20. And in Second Chronicles chapter 20, we read about a king who is king of... Um, who is, oh, sorry, I'm looking for Second Chronicles, that's why I can't find it. I remember I have my Bible here and I'm looking at the wrong pages. Second Chronicles chapter 20, here we are. Uh, that's better. In Second Chronicles chapter 20, we read about Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat is currently a king of Judah and he is ruling over Jerusalem and other parts. And at this time, we read in verse one, it happened after this people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them beside the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. And some came to Jehoshaphat and said, a great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord. So the first thing I want you to notice is there is a huge army coming against Jehoshaphat. And on his own, there is no way he can do it. Now, some people, when faced with this challenge, challenges that just seem to overwhelm us, our default position is to start to despair. I'm never going to be able to do this, to lose hope or even to. And I'm sure no one in Denmark does this. This is a speciality of we British. You do it too, actually. Um, we complain. No, it's which maybe we even try and blame somebody else. It's their fault. Why did they do this to me? It's not fair. They should And on and on we moan and complain and complain and moan, moan and complain about it. Not Jehoshaphat. He said, I am going to seek the Lord. And so as we read on in this story in Second Chronicles chapter 20, um, and you can go if you want to go and read this passage for yourself uh, a little later on. I'm going to jump straight to um, straight to uh, verse 14. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jahaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jeel, the son of Methaniah, a Levite, the sons of Asaph in the midst of assembly. And he said, listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants in Jerusalem. Verse 16. Tomorrow, go down against them. 
They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the book before the wilderness of Joel. But, verse 17, you will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. The prophet speaks to Jehoshaphat and to the army and says, look, you're not going to have to fight. Go out tomorrow before them and see that God is with you. And so uh, Jehoshaphat calls the rest of the chapter, he calls together his uh, army and he calls together the people and he says, we shall go out and we shall declare the goodness of the Lord. We're going to trust in God in the middle of this difficult time. We're going to start to praise God and declare how mighty he is. They go out saying this, praise the Lord, verse 21, for his mercy endures forever. Okay, so this kind of makes sense. But here's the bit which I want us to focus in on. All right. When he consulted, verse 21, with the people he appointed who should sing to the Lord, who should praise the beauty of the holiness, they went out before the army. So they asked the Lord, look, who, Lord, who should be singing? Who should be, who should we be using to play the instruments here? Who are we going to send forth as the musicians? They gather together their choir and their orchestra and they send them out into battle against a huge army before the soldiers of Jehoshaphat's army. I, I don't know if you can imagine being one of those musicians. I don't know if there's a little part of you that says, why would you send me out ahead of the... At least give me a shield or a sword or, or something, not just a little musical instrument. <laughs> what do you want me to do? Play so badly that the, all of the soldiers go, ah, stop, stop torturing us. And, and some people, maybe they would have... Um, like their lyres, a bit like guitars, they'd be playing there and they think, well, maybe I can use this to bash people over the head with. I don't know how long it's going to last, but we're going to go for it. And uh, others with their smaller instruments, maybe looking with envy, going, I wish I had a bigger instrument. <laughs> and then the singers are like, at least you have something in your hand. What are we going to do? Sing them to death? <laughs> well, that's not their attitude. They have heard the word of the Lord that he's going to be with them and they know their role is to praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Um, they're willing to trust God so much that the only weapon that they are going out with is a weapon of praise. Uh, I, I don't know if you've ever had a crisis happen around you. I'm sure for many of us, we have. Um, I, I think of lots of times in our life where we've looked and thought we just don't know what we're going to do. But I have learnt that in the middle of the crisis, that's the right time to pick up your instruments, to open your mouth and to start to praise the Lord. Um, let, let me tell you one time. We moved house about five years ago. And when we were due to move from one home to another home, for uh, various reasons, we got to the point where we, the home we were moving to, we would not be allowed to move to it. And it looked like moving from a small place to a larger place, which was, uh, instead of being two hours from my parents, would be right next door to them, 10, 15 minutes drive away. Um, this seemed to be the move God had for us and everything was lining up and then suddenly, we were unable to move house. Now, this may not be the biggest disaster in the world. I accept there are far more serious things that are going on. Um, but my first, what I want you to hear is my first response was to go before God and start to praise him. Why? Because he's bigger than any house. If my, my praise was, Lord, you are so amazing. If you want us to stay in this home that we live in for the rest of our lives, we're happy here. We're content. We praise you. We thank you. You are good. You are perfect. And we just started to praise and worship God and sing songs to him. And you know what? Within two days, the whole situation had turned around and God had supernaturally intervened to help us to go. Uh, there's been other times when we've faced a disaster and our response is 
praise. And I, I want to encourage you to be like Jehoshaphat in this way, that you're willing to trust what God says in his word. Trust the word of the Lord. That when you see things piling up around you, maybe you hold on to a verse like Romans 8, 28, for we know that all things work together for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. And you see things going wrong around you, but you say, because I love God, I know it's going to work for my good. And so I am going to take time now to praise God right here, right now. And you start to just praise him. Other people may think you're crazy, but you know that you are crazy, do you see what I did there, made up that word, that you are somebody who is willing to praise God because you know that God is not just bigger than you, he is bigger than any problem that may come your way. Why would we not put our trust in God? Will we only praise him when good things happen and not when bad things happen? I love the words of the prophet, so it's one of my favourite passages, um, actually, that the prophet speaks out. He's in the middle of a challenging time. And his summary of all that he's gone through, his summary of all the trials and challenges that he's faced is, is so, um, so stark compared to what we would normally see. Let me read to you. This is the very end of Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 3, and I'm going to read verse 17. It says this, Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, so we don't have any figs, we don't have any grapes, Though the labour of the olive may fail, we don't have any olives, and the fields yield no food. Let me read that again. The fields yield no food. We have not just no figs and no fruit and no olives. We can manage without them. But now the fields are giving us no food. Though the animals may be cut off from the fold, though there be no herd in the stalls, so not only do the field have no food, now there is no animals to provide us with meat and milk and all the other things that we use animals for. What, what, what would be your response to that? If all that happens to me, then fill in the gap. The right answer is, well, let's read verse 18. I think you know where I'm going with this. If you understood anything of what I said about Jehoshaphat, I think you know where I'm heading. Yet... I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet and he will make me walk on my high hills. Even though everything goes wrong, even though it looks like we're going to starve, that we have nothing around us, Habakkuk says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Why? Because he is my strength. He is the one who can take me through this. And this morning we spoke a little bit about seeking the Lord and his strength. Well, when we understand God's strength, then we know no matter what happens, we can have an attitude of praise and of thankfulness. OK, that's the first passage I wanted us to look at. The second passage is in Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. Let me give you a little bit of context for this passage. In Acts chapter 16, and we'll read from, uh, uh, we'll read around verse 25. We're going to be there. In Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas, two people who have been walking around and spreading the good news about Jesus, they have been locked up in prison. The reason they've been locked in prison is because there was a lady who was possessed by demons and she had been saying, um, for following them around wherever they went. She'd been saying, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And you may think, um, well, this is uh, this is good, isn't it? She's pointing out to other people that, that uh, they, they've got the way of God, that they're talking about salvation. But imagine someone who is controlled, possessed by a demon. And we know that because later in a moment, um, the spirit is going to be cast out from her following you wherever you go. Imagine wherever you're going to shopping, you're looking in the market stores and you're hearing this person crying out the same thing again and again behind you. These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And remember, Paul and Silas were ones who didn't just seek God and seek his strength. They saw his face and something in them as they understood the spirit that was controlling her was grieving them until they had Paul greatly annoyed. I like this. I like the fact it says greatly annoyed. <laughs> I like the fact that Paul is allowed to be annoyed 
by stuff. Then, then, you know, if you've been in churches for a while or if you've lived life for a while, you know, there are some people who sometimes will annoy you. But um, Paul has seeing not just her as a person. He's understanding what's going on in the spirit. He turns and says to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. Now, this spirit had enabled this woman to tell fortunes. And as she'd been doing that, she'd been earning money for those who owned her. And when the masters saw that she could um, no longer have the same power that she had because the spirit was no longer with her. At that moment, they say, seize Paul and Silas. And so Paul and Silas are now in jail. The verse 23, we read, when they'd laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison. These guys, have, these men have been whipped. Their backs are hurting. They're locked up in jail. The key has gone. They don't know what the future holds. They haven't read the rest of the chapter. They don't know what the solution to this problem is going to be. What they do know is they're in big trouble. They're locked up with prisoners. And who knows how those other prisoners would treat them. They're in pain because their backs have been beaten. We don't know what food they've been fed. We don't know what mood they're in. But we do know that in the circumstances they're in, they have, it seems, every single right to complain a little bit. They have the right. If anyone has the right to complain about the situation they're in, I would suggest to you Paul and Silas locked up in prison for doing a good work, for trying to help somebody who was possessed by a spirit, for seeking to pursue God. If anybody has the right to complain, Paul and Silas probably do. I mean, we read of people like Jonah in the Bible. Jonah is the prophet who was told to go to Nineveh and to tell the people to repent. He went the other way to Joppa, got swallowed by the big fish and then was spat out onto the land. Then he went again. And when he preached to those people, the city of Nineveh went into that God was going to come and bring destruction to Nineveh. When Jonah preached that message, all the people wore sackcloth. They started to repent. And as they repented of their sins, God said, I will not bring destruction on them anymore. I forgive them. Well, Jonah, he instead of celebrating, he goes to have a little pity party. I don't know if you know this part of the story. This bit's less well known. He's sitting in the desert and a plant grows up behind him. And he goes, I knew I shouldn't have come here. It's, uh, I knew if I came here, God, that you would be merciful. And now I look all all like a fool because I said you were going to destroy the place and you didn't destroy it because you had mercy on me. I knew that's what was going to happen. I was right to run away. Oh, poor me. And then this plant the Lord allows to grow up and he enjoys Jonah in this desert in the hot land, enjoys the shade of the plant. But the next day a worm comes and eats the plant and destroys it and then Jonah's response is oh it's not fair now look what's happened to me there was not even a plant to protect me that plant should have been there you hear him moaning and complaining and God says well wait 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 are you right to complain in this way Jonah goes basically he says yes <laughs> you care for this plant how much more should I care for the thousands of people who live in Nineveh and seek to spare them when they turn to me? God's saying, you shouldn't really be complaining. Uh, another complainer, Elijah, he's there and uh, he's called a drought to come. And this drought has come and uh, he's uh, aware that people now want to kill him along the way. Um, and his response is to moan and complain. Uh, there were no other prophets. I'm the only one who's left. What's going to happen to me? They want to kill me. And and it was a real complaint. Other prophets in that time were killed for speaking the word of God. This is not some fictional thing in his mind. Elijah's life was genuinely at risk. But God doesn't really answer his complaint. He just sends him back to go and get on with the job that he's given him to do. So to complain, we understand that that sometimes circumstances around us give us full permission to complain. But I would suggest to you that Paul and Silas at this moment, locked in jail with their backs hurting, having been beaten with the city turned against them, they would have every right to complain. 
and to have feel sorry for themselves, to have a little pity party where they go, oh, poor me, oh, poor us. Now, maybe the right response if they were a bit more godly would be to cry out to God in prayer, oh God, save us, spare us from this. But not Paul and Silas. They didn't have a pity party. They didn't even have a massive prayer meeting. Instead, they had a praise party. Listen to this. Let me read to you from Acts 16 and verse 25 and 26. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. They're not having a pity party. They're praying and singing hymns to God. They're having a praise party. And not only are they doing this, but everyone is listening to them. Something about their heart response in the middle of their trial. They are up at midnight declaring the praises of God and speaking with him. Then verse 26, suddenly there was a great earthquake. What are my favourite verses in the Bible is the word suddenly. Um, why? Because that you wait and wait and wait for God to intervene and then suddenly there's a moment when God steps in. Well this is a suddenly moment. There was a great earthquake, the foundation of the prisons were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. Um, and you can read the rest of that story for yourself in Acts chapter 16 but the jailer comes out and he's about to kill himself thinking when he sees all the doors open that all the prisoners must have escaped but he discovers that not not one of them has left. Let me find that bit for you. Um, it says, supposing that uh, do, for, Paul says verse 28, we are all here. Think about that. Th think about that for a moment. The prison doors have been opened. The prisoners' chains have been loosed. Yet not one prisoner chooses to try and escape from the jail. Why not? Why would they remain in this earthquake? Their moment of freedom has come. They could escape and no one would know any different. Yet they are all still there. No chains on door wide open. Well, what have they been doing just before? They've been listening to Paul and Silas praising and praying to God, singing hymns and praying to God. Something of the atmosphere of this praise party has not just changed Paul and Silas, has not just changed the doors and brought this earthquake to, bring, uh, to, to break their chains, it has also changed the hearts of these prisoners that they don't try and escape at this moment. Let, let me show this to you. A pity party will lead you to more darkness, but a praise party will help you to bring joy and light wherever you go. And you'll know this is true. You'll know that people who are positive and always smiling and upbeat and thankful and praising God in good times and hard, they're nice people to be around, aren't they? But if you know someone who's always complaining and moaning and complaining and moaning and complaining and, mo well, they, they can sometimes be hard work. Um, and this is a decision that we make in our mind. And if you, perhaps as I'm speaking, you're thinking, oh, I'm one of those who would be more likely to complain and moan. Um, I'm going to give you a key in a minute to kind of changing your way of thinking. We've pointed to it a few times already in this session together. Um, but before I do that, uh, I, I want to um, encourage you to think about your default position. Are you someone who is more likely to praise and be thankful? Or are you someone who is more likely to complain and whinge? Um, you heard the story of uh, the children who uh, one always looks on the bright side of life and the other one always thinks about the bad side of life. And he listens to his children and hears that they love horses. And so the father one day gives to one of his children um, the one who's always complaining about everything, and he gives them a horse. 
And when the child sees the horse, the thing he wanted, the child goes, oh no, now I'm going to have to clean it and oh, I won't even get a day off. And they start to moan and complain that they've received the thing that they wanted. Meanwhile, to their other child, instead of giving them a horse, they give them a huge pile of horse manure. And when the child goes into the room and sees the horse manure, they start jumping around and going, yes, this is so wonderful. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, daddy. And the dad looks at the child and goes, why are you thanking me for giving you horse manure? What, what are you planning on doing with this horse manure that you're so excited? The child turns around, the eyes wide open, and goes, dad, if there's this much horse manure here, there must be a horse somewhere. I want us to be people, and not I, but God wants us to be people who are thankful and positive no matter what happens. And if you find yourself as someone who is more likely to complain, then I want to encourage you to make a habit of counting your blessings. There was a, an old song you say, count your blessings, name them one by one, that you stop and think, what? Okay, yes, these problems are around. Yes, these things are not um, these things are not easy for me to face, but I am still going to accept the blessings that I have. For example, you're alive. <laughs> you're breathing. You're here on camp with people who care about you. There, there are always things that you can bless God for. It might be that you can't afford the nicest food that you like, but do you have food still on your table? That's another blessing that you can thank God for. And I would encourage you to make it a habit each night, um, at some point in the evening, just to thank God for the blessings that he's given you. Sometimes in our household, quite often around the evening meal, we sit around the table and we say, each person has to say one thing that they are thankful for, for the past 24 hours. Has to have happened in the last 24 hours and it can't be the same thing every night. Um, but they have to choose one thing that they're thankful for. That process of just stopping to think what good has happened is so healthy for us. I have a friend who, when I go to Colombia, she's my, often my translator there, and she makes it a habit. Halfway through the trip, she'll say something like, let's thank God for the miracles. What miracles have happened so far on this trip? And quite often, especially when I first met her, I'd be going, um... Not a lot that I can think of. And she would start to name things. She's like, oh, yes, when there was so much traffic and it looked like we was going to be late for that meeting, but we suddenly got there. And then when we met that person who helped us to connect with the other person to the other person, we ended up on that radio show. And on the radio show, when they asked you those questions, which were just what you needed to be able to talk about this thing, and on and on and on, we, she goes and I start joining in, sharing things. Oh, and that, that gentleman we met and we got to pray for him and he came back the next night and said how God had really helped him and things had already begun to change in his life. And, and oh yes, the 30 people who gave their lives to the Lord in that meeting. And we start to share the things God's done and I go from oh this trip is hard work to I want it to go on forever God is moving in this place and I'm a part of it and the thankfulness starts to rise up inside me because we've taken time to stop and choose to be thankful and to give praise okay so we've got about 10 minutes left together in this time and um <clears throat> I want to uh, lead you in a little time of praise together. I hope you're going to go with me for this. Uh, first of all, I think we'll set this challenge, first of all, before I, I introduce the musical number that we are going to share together. Um, I'm going to give you uh, two minutes just to break yourselves into groups of three or four people. Don't do it yet. Listen to the instructions. I want you to share, each share, one thing that you are thankful for from the past 24 hours. I'm going to give you, um, I'll give you two minutes to do it, give you time to get into groups and uh, we'll put a timer up on this screen so you know how long you, you have. Try and let everyone have a chance to talk, introduce yourselves as you get into your groups and then share one thing you are thankful for from the past 24 hours. Off you go.
Okay, welcome back. Now, for the Jewish people at Passover time, they have a song that they often sing, and I'm going to sing it to you. First of all, I'll give you the tune. <laughs> words are this, dai dai yenu, dai dai yenu, dai yenu just means that would have been enough. I'll explain how it's used in a minute. Listen to the song. Dai dai yenu, dai dai yenu, dai dai yenu, dai yenu, dai yenu, dai dai yenu, dai dai yenu, dai dai yenu, dai yenu, dai yenu. Okay, sing it with me. Dai dai ye nu, dai dai ye nu, dai dai ye nu, dai ye nu, dai ye nu. Now, the way that they use this song is they'll talk about how had God just created the world, that would have been enough. Dai dai, and off they go into the song. And then they go, had he created the world and made us in his image, that would have been enough. Dai dai ye nu. Dai, dai, ye, no. Had he created the world, made us in his image, and then given us um, sunlight and food to eat, that would have been enough. Can you see this? Had God just done one of these things, that would have been more than what we deserve. And yet we start to layer on, layer after layer for the Jews. They talk about how he rescued them from slavery, slavery in Egypt, how he brought them into a good land, how he sent the plagues one after another, blessing after blessing after blessing. <laughs> just one of these would have been enough for God. It would have been more than we deserve. And yet they pile up still more and more and more. Well, we are going to go on a little journey for the last 10 minutes together where uh, I'm going to give you two minutes each time to think about something. And then when we come back, we're all going to declare out the thing that you've thought about. And then we'll sing the dai dai ye nu, dai dai ye nu, dai dai ye nu, dai ye nu, dai ye nu. And uh, so we're just going to start um, with different sections I'll give you. So the first section, I want you to think of something, each of you in your groups share together, one thing that you are thankful that God has given to you, which he gives to all people who live on earth. Uh, it might be your life, might be breath, might be food, might be something else. I'm going to give you two minutes to discuss that and off you go. Okay, welcome back. On the count of three, I want you to call out the thing that you are thankful for, and then we're going to sing that chorus together. One, two, three. 
Die, die, yeah, no, die, die, yeah, no, die, die, yeah, no, die, yeah, no, die, yeah, no. Okay, next, this one may be a little bit harder for some of you. I want you to think of something that you are thankful for from your childhood. Some of you that will be easy, and others of you it's going to be a little bit harder, but there will be something that you can be thankful for and thank God for from your childhood. You've got two minutes in your groups, off you go. <clears throat> okay, welcome back. I would like you to speak out loud once more. Um, something about speaking out loud and hearing our own voice. And I don't know what it is, it helps change our thinking sometimes. If you're feeling a bit kind of, ugh, when you start to speak out the things you're thankful for and you hear them, it reminds you that it's good. Uh, one verse says, faith comes by hearing the word of God, not just reading it on a page or thinking about it, but when we hear it with our ears, something just changes on the inside of us. It's how God's wired us. So on the count of three, I want you to uh, speak out the thing, something you're thankful for from your childhood. One, two, three. Die, die, yeah, no, die, die, yeah, no, die, die, yeah, no, die, yeah, no, die, yeah, no. Now we're going to think of something you are thankful for in your friendships that you have. Two minutes, off you go. Welcome back. Speak out something you are thankful for from your friendships. Ready? One, two, three. Die, die, yeah, no, die, die, yeah, no, die, die, yeah, no, die, yeah, no, die, yeah, no. Okay, one more, two more areas. This next one, I want you to think of something that you are thankful that God has done for you something specific. It might be an answer to prayer. It might be um, some way that he's accepted you. It might be some way that he's helped you to change. I'm going to give you, because it might take a bit longer to share this, I'm going to give you three minutes to talk about something you're thankful that God has done for you. Three minutes, off you go.
Welcome back. I'm going to give you a moment to speak out something you are thankful to God for. Here we go. Die, die, no, die, die, no, die, die, no, die, no, die, no. Okay, and finally, I'm going to open this a bit broader. This is something you're thankful for for your future or just anything else that you want to speak out thanks to God for. Share it in your groups. Again, I'm giving you uh, two minutes to discuss this together and then we will share it all out loud. Welcome back. This is our final one. So let's sing this last one out loud and clear. Speak out loud one more thing that you are thankful to God for. Three, two, one, go. Die, die, ye nu. Die, die, ye nu. Die, die, ye nu. Die, ye nu. Die, ye nu. Die, die, ye nu. Die, die, ye nu, die, die, ye nu, die, ye nu, die, ye nu. Thank you, God. Lord, we thank you. Just join with me. Thank you, God. You have blessed us in so many ways. Let us never forget all of your blessings to us and continually allow us to, ne to thank you. Never with pity parties, but always with praise parties, because you are good to us. Amen. Amen. Well, I hope you've enjoyed that little journey with me and uh, we will see you again tomorrow morning. Have a great night's sleep and enjoy the rest of this time this evening together. God bless you. Bye.